Welcome back, everyone, uh, to this edition of the Stogie Geek Show. This segment is sponsored by Mr. J. Savannah Smoke Shop. Join them on December 8th for a collaboration cigar dinner with Broadway Cigars at Trattoria Roma on Providence's famous Federal Hill. The cigar dinner will feature all four Grotto Series cigars in a four-course meal. Tickets are now available in the shop for $50 each. And now I'll turn it over to Will to introduce our next very special guest. Well, um, so glad to welcome back to the Stogie Geeks a, a friend of the show, a friend of mine, um, and Victor Vital of Legacy Brands. Victor, Will and Paul in Rhode Island, how are you doing today? Fantastic. Thanks for having me on. No, uh, well, you know, obviously welcome back. Um, for folks who may not be familiar with Legacy Brands, we do have a lot of new listeners probably since you've been on. Why don't you just give us an overview of uh, what, what your brands are and what, you, you know, what cigars you have. Uh, the Tortuga Reserva, Tortuga 215 Reserva, and the Oro Vivo Armand de Sante are the core brands. Right, so the, let's start with the Oro Vivo. That's a, a unique project you've done with Armand de Sante. Yes. Yes, and um, he's at the show. It's been two years so far. Uh, three blends have been introduced. The American blend, which came in the black boxes, which was four sizes. The European blend, which was exclusively for Europe, which was four sizes. And now the World Edition, which is still currently available right now in four sizes for the larger sizes, not the European sizes. So you'd be looking at the seven and a half by fifty-eight, six by sixty, six by fifty-six, and five by fifty-four. So those lines, I mean, they, are they like limited production runs that you small batch runs that you're doing, and you're kind of changing them up? Is that kind of where you're going with that line? Yeah, it's something that uh, Armand is really interested in. He really is enjoying learning about tobacco and the blending process, and just seeing how intricate the slightest variation of tobacco use can affect the overall blend. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier, Victor. Uh, there was a cigar that um, Paul Joyle was working on blending, and he said that he, uh, in some of the earlier ones, he took out one Viso leaf, Yep. and it completely changed the whole cigar. Yeah. Just it's, that one it's leaf. It's really incredible. It's incredible. I mean, you, you talk about one leaf, half leaves, uh, different primings. Uh, you know, just going up one priming can change everything. Mm -hmm. and, and I got to say, Victor, I give you a lot of credit, you know, in terms of if you've tweaked some of these blends, but yet you've kind of said it's a different cigar as opposed to trying to just make it the same cigar. Um, it kind of at least, I give you a lot of credit for putting that out there like that. We were having a conversation last night, a couple of guys, about that. And we think that's real key, you know, to do that. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in the craft. I mean, as you guys probably know, maybe your listeners, if they're not too familiar, it, for me, it's all about the craft. It's about the art, the culture, the tradition. And it's about keeping things progressive. It's really important. And the smoker today at least the enthusiast today is really interested in trying new things it's kind of like when you walk into a wine store and uh... if paul joyle was around he could probably uh... shake his head or agree with me somehow or even if he's listening you don't want to if you're a wine drinker you don't want to drink the same wine over and over again if you're a scotch drinker you know you may have your favorite or your go-to but you're going to be willing to try different things to see uh, different variety, you know, it's it, it's the spice of life to have all of these uh, different progressive new things be made available. And I think that when you come down to the tobacconist level, uh, it's really interesting that when consumers come in and they ask for what's new, that they can present them with something that's actually new and not just something that they haven't tried before that's been around for 10 years. Absolutely. Now, with Armand's line, I think it's been, as far as, a, and you and I have had this conversation before, but as far as bringing, and, and Armand's a celebrity, I mean, this has been a very su successful cigar um, in terms of a celebrity. I mean, I, I know a lot of people who've gone to this cigar. It's, it's um, you know, it's, it's a smaller batch of production. Um, I'd say limited production is, is if I, if I'll take the liberty there, but yeah. it's been successful, and I, and I think 
it has a lot to do with how you've engaged Armand in that process, which has been very different than probably any other celebrity that's come into the cigar business. Why don't you talk about that? Well, you know, in the beginning, without going through the whole story, as you know, I had my reservations, and even Armand had his reservations about entering into the cigar business, although it's been a passion of his for a very long time. Look, he's a humble guy. And the proof is there when you guys meet him at the trade show or at uh, events or functions. You really get to talk to him and really see how humble he is. He, he's a guy that continuously practices his work. He'll never claim to be an expert. He's always trying harder. And when it comes to cigars, he is so willing to learn, so willing to get involved. And it has nothing to do with ego. And as you know, in the past, maybe some of the attempts with other Hollywood celebrities or sports celebrities, it was just a matter of lending their name or trying to capitalize on their fame from another industry. Whereas you take a guy like Armand, and he truly loves premium cigars. It's a real passion for him. Yeah, I mean, he. Is, I mean, I've had a chance now to meet him at the trade show, you know, a couple times, and he's a stogie geek. He really is, um, where he has that passion. But like you said, he just loves this stuff, and he, you know, he spent four days at the trade show two years in a row, which, as you know, is a very tough thing to do. And he seemed to really enjoy himself. He loves it. He loves small business. He loves engaging with folks who own small businesses. It's it's still just so fascinating to me because as many times as I've hung out with Armand, uh, uh, we spoke business together, I've stayed at his house, uh, traveled together, restaurants, etc. It, it's still just so cool to see someone so interested in our small industry. And when you really break that down, it has nothing to do with industry itself. It has everything to do with tobacco. He's fascinated with uh, what tobacco brings to the table, what premium cigars bring to the table, and how it affects people's lives. And that goes perfectly in line with my thinking and my philosophy for the entire industry. It's a fellowship. It's camaraderie. The cigar can't be replicated. It's something that brings people together that cannot be duplicated along the lines of anything else, in my opinion. Some people will say, well, wine or beer or something like that, but in my opinion, not, not like a cigar. We just, you know, it's funny. We just had that conversation with Phil Zangi, how it's a conduit to these other things that you, you talk about. Yeah, it, it certainly is. I agree. Now, in terms of the kind of going forward, is Armand and you, are you going to continue to work together on this Oro Vivo line? Is, should we expect more Oro Vivo projects? Yeah, I expect more. Uh, currently working on a few different blends, uh, some more limited production, limited edition type stuff. Uh, that's the stuff that he seems to really be interested in, and that's the stuff that the tobacconists and consumers alike have really been receptive towards. And, you know, we keep uh, being asked, what's next? Uh, what else do you have that's, that's going to come out that's limited? And for me, it's it's really a pleasure to be able to work with tobacco that's very limited. It's a pleasure to work with production that's very limited because it really changes the game. Yeah, absolutely. I think it makes it, you know, being the stogie geek, it makes it interesting. It keeps it very interesting on that. Now, you have a, your other brand um, is your Tortuga 215 line. And that line's really grown in the past <coughs> year. I mean, you've you launched it last year. You added a uh, a Brazilian, the Coyote Negro, and um, now I know you have plans with the Connecticut, correct? Yeah, that's right. January is the release of the Connecticut, and uh, it's actually uh, it's funny to say January there's going to be a release because nobody releases something new in January, and uh, some of my good friends who own cigar shops that have been doing it a long time said, are you crazy? You're coming out with something new in January. And, you know, again, it's, it's, it's about keeping things fresh 
keeping things new and keeping things in front of the consumer for me at the right time. And I feel like uh, coming out with something in January, maybe again in April and again at the trade show is really important to keep those fresh hits coming out on a nice time schedule for the consumer to stay interested in the product to see what's coming next. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you, when you started out with the, um, the Tortuga 215 Reserve line, you launched that at the 2013 show. That was your Nicaraguan Puro. And That's correct, yeah. The original uh, box press four sizes. Yep, only. and then you expanded it to the, uh, the, the Cedro, Cedro. Yeah, the Cedro number no. 5 was released that November, and the Cedro Bellicoso was released in the end of January this year. Now, I know you were talking about a third size, um, the number 10, which is, uh, this, I believe that's the 58 ring gauge, six and a half. That's is that right, still yeah. on, on, is there still plans for that one? Yeah, actually, uh, it's resting right now, and um, I am hoping to receive it in January. So, so that, that line's a real interesting line because, you know, you went with the box press and you went with the, the rounded, uh, and the rounded ones have the cedar wrap. Talk about maybe some of the, the intricacies about the differences with those because I, I think they do smoke different but they still have the same profile well you know going back to okay so you take what uh, Paul said earlier about uh, uh, Paul Joyle uh, talking about just adjusting the BSO and how it changes the whole blend without changing the foundation of the blend and without changing the integrity of the blend there are some minor tweaks that you could make that could change the overall flavor of the cigar by up to 30 percent which is a noticeable difference now when you talk to the experts they'll say that no one could really tell a five to seven percent difference it's going to taste like the same cigar with a five to seven percent margin but once you get outside of that margin you will start to pick up some of the uh, uh, smaller hits of flavor you know maybe a smaller hit of pepper maybe black pepper turns to white pepper or however you describe the, uh, the flavors and tastes on your palate, you'll start to notice a difference. So with the original box press line, I consider that to be a medium body cigar. Now, you know from speaking in the past, I never compromise balance for strength. So in order to create something using the tobaccos that I have available to me, for me, if I have a goal in mind, I'm going to take that goal right to the line where we don't go over because I have to have balance. I don't want to, you know, there's no such thing as just adding another piece of Lajero in there and then BAM, you have a stronger cigar. It just, it just doesn't work that way. That's pretty much the, the shortcut of the explanation of the process. So the, the Cedro series is a slightly bolder offering of the original box press. That's the most clean way without getting overly descriptive that I can uh, describe it. No, no, I, I kind of agree with you on that. Now then, then what you did um, right before the trade show is you came out with a Brazilian Matafina version of that cigar um, in that line, the El Coyote Negro. So talk a mm -hmm. little about that. Is that cigar actually out yet? Or I know it was soft launched earlier. Yeah, it is It is out. Um, it was released at the trade show this year. Uh, it was available to ship. The uh, first batch uh, completely sold out by the third day of the trade show. Uh, the second batch uh, was in production because I had expected it, it to do really well. Uh, you were nice enough to review it and uh, give me your personal thoughts, which were uh, held very highly. I appreciate it. And um, uh, guys like Rick Hacker, uh, the folks at Cigar Federation, um, some of my personal friends that are uh, uh, have very good palates, they all, you want to call them the smoking panel or uh, just, you know, personal taste is really what I'm interested in. I, I really want to see how different people react to the taste. So I tested it with all of my friends and it just came back like unanimously positive. 
So, you know, I really took a shot with something that, you know, when you go to market, you can be a little apprehensive, even though you know you have something that's really great. You use the best raw materials. You found a great wrapper leaf from Brazil, which, in my opinion, is just absolutely incredible. Matafina mm. is just so beautiful. Mm. And then you have people taste it, but still you get to the trade show and you never know how the tobacconists that you're presenting it to are going to take it. You never know what they're going to say or what they're going to do with it. But thank goodness the reception was very positive. Um, I was able to keep production going because I had the ability to buy enough to supply me until the end of the year. And we're almost sold out of the second shipment of the Brazilian Matapina. Victor, um, I wanted to ask you, when you take um, a filler and binder and then you put a new wrapper on it, like, do you have to experiment? Like, you, mu you don't know what that's going to taste like until you actually do it. Like, is there... Or did you have like something in mind that kind of led you towards Brazilian Matafina that you thought would go well with that particular binder and filler? Well, you have to make the adjustments uh, in the filler. And sometimes you have to change the binder entirely. So in my product, when you look at the three different styles which are currently available, the fourth is coming in January, the Connecticut, uh, there are variations. It's not, I'm not using the same tobacco that I use in the box press that I'm using in the Cedro line that I'm using in the Maduro line. So the variations are there. I mean, in my opinion, it's very difficult to just change the wrapper. It's not like a car where you're just going to change the paint on the car and everything else is going to remain the same. Uh, it's very challenging. Uh, if you have the ability to do that, you know, that's, that's great. You found some uh, uh, really versatile tobacco that you're using and, you know, it could work over a, a wide uh, a scale, which um, I think is great. But for the tobacco that I'm using, you know, everything has to have a tweak. You know, the craft is there. There's always these little tweaks, little things that make the difference. So getting to Brazilian Matafina, I always wanted to make a really good Maduro cigar. And as you know, Maduro leaf is very hard to come by, at least the good stuff. Am I right? In fact, we had Nick Maloa on earlier, and not only is it hard to come by, Brazilian Matafina, he was saying, is becoming even more difficult to come by now. It is. It's, it's nearly impossible to get the good stuff, the higher priming, the stuff that's pliable, that has the elasticity, that could sustain the extra fermentation and the heat from the Maduro process naturally. So, you know, right now you have a lot of use with broadleaf, you have a lot of use with uh, San Andres, uh, you have a lot of use with uh, Nicaragua, uh, and maybe even some Ecuador. But Matafina has a sweetness property that, in my opinion, cannot be duplicated. Oh, when those, when those sugars kind of, I like to call them the sugars, when they kind of come after it's aging and that cigar just starts to bind up a bit, it really, and then that, that's what, and I've had, like I said, I've had a privilege of smoking the Negro, and, and that's, that's really what made it spe I mean, special. It, it's a, if folks haven't had that cigar, they need to, they need to check that cigar out, um, particularly if you like Brazilian Matafina. It, it's an excellent, excellent offering. Thank you, Will. Yeah, for me, it's kind of like an espresso. You know how you have three parts of the espresso? You have the creme, the sweet, and the bitter. The, the Matafina is the, is the real creme. It's, uh, it's, it's very nice. So, you know, this is kind of a follow-up with Paul says. So as far as doing small batch production goes, um, you know, one thing that we, we find out is diff there's different vintages of tobacco that could change the blend. Are, they, are these things that you kind of look at as far as when you're blending when you kind of have to go into another vintage, um, are these things you look at in terms of how it's going to affect the blend? Well, you know, as you know, it's it's a natural product with a natural process, and even even if you have the same tobacco, if you stay longer during the fermentation process or under in the fermentation process, you're going to create different tastes and different sensations on the palate. So it's it's very, and I can't emphasize the word very any much more, difficult to get the same cigar over and over and over again. 
without having that five to seven percent variation. Good point. Good point. Now, would you just one more question on the Negro? Would you say that's? I thought it was a stronger, you know, more fuller blend than the the Reserva. Would, is that how you would categorize it? I would categorize the Tocuga, uh Brazil Mabafina strong. It's uh, it's definitely full body. I would say it's the fullest body, full fullest strength offering that I have. Um, you'd be surprised, you know. Uh, I was with a retailer last week in Maryland, actually, and he was lighting up. And he asked me, you know, he gave me that that look. He's been in the, he's been in the business for about 25 years. He gave me that look, and he said, "How do you categorize this cigar?" And I said, "Well, I, I, to me, it's it's full body. That's you know what I what I went for." And he and he looked at him. This is mild. And uh, about five minutes later, he sat down in his chair and he looked at me and he said, "That cigar snuck up on me. It's definitely full body." <laughs> <laughs> we, how many times has that happened to all of us? <laughs> yep. <laughs> right. Right. But you know, I, I was actually proud. I, I kind of had a laugh with him, and I was proud because we both agreed after having the conversation that the cigar is so balanced that you don't notice the strength until you actually get into it yeah no I, I and I would definitely agree with that um, from having smoked it so as far as now, now the, the third one which is you said is coming out in January the Connecticut what can we kind of look forward to with this particular Connecticut well you know it, it's interesting I'm, I'm not really sure what to say uh, I know that the latest trend is fuller body Connecticut. So, I, you know, I don't want to say that it's going to be more of a traditional Connecticut, which to me, when I say traditional Connecticut, I'm talking more like Romeo Real. Uh, Macanudo is a traditional Connecticut. Uh, Ashton Classic is a traditional Connecticut. And from what I've been seeing from some companies is that they're taking Connecticut to the next level when it comes to strength, spice, and overall mouthfeel. So, um, I'd like to say that I'm going to be more towards the traditional Connecticut, but not as far up as the Connecticut that you've seen lately that's been introduced. So, maybe like right into right in the middle, but more leaning towards the mild side. So, Which, right, right. Which gives you another segment for your, for your brand to hit. So, I mean, that's a real good thing. Yeah, you know, I'm more of a traditionalist. I, I really try very hard to keep tradition in mind. Uh, I'm, I'm not much of a trendsetter. That's, that's not my thing. So if people are out there thinking that I'm either trying to set a trend or that I'm just behind the trend, it, that has nothing to do with me. I, uh, my tribute is tradition. So uh, with everything that I do and come out with, you can, you can pretty much expect it to be more towards the traditional side of the chart. Absolutely, absolutely. So Victor, kind of just turning gears a bit, you know, there's a lot of changes happening in the industry right now. There's some consolidations, um, you know, FDA. What's kind of your read right now on, on kind of the state of, let's say, the boutique cigar business right now? Um, where do you think we're heading with this right now? Do you mean in regards to FDA regulation? Yeah, let's start with FDA regulation. Then I'll, I'll tackle it too. Is first FDA regulation, and then as far as consolidation goes. Well, as you know, FDA regulation is here, and now we're all just kind of idly standing by, waiting for the FDA to say, "Okay, this is exactly how we're going to regulate premium cigars." So uh, it's kind of scary. Uh, Especially if you have a trademark post-2007, which is about 80% of the trademarks in the business. So, and if you have a pre-2007 mark, it, according to what I understand, it better be active. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's no revitalizing old marks or anything like that. So, you know, sometimes I've had so many conversations on this where people were just saying that, oh, I found this mark from the Don Nobody phase in 1998 when they went out of business, I'll just revive that, and that's just, that's not going to fly. So, you know, um, some people are going to be able to keep up with the FDA uh, uh, regulations, some people are going to be able to pay 
the uh, the extortion rate, I guess you can call it, that uh, is going to, you know, the bill is going to show up that you're going to have to pay, uh, whether it's a licensing or some sort of uh, regulatory process that costs money. Um, so it's going to be an interesting day for boutiques that are either just getting into the game or are doing this casually or as a second gig. Uh, you know, that's that's a big decision day for those guys to make on whether or not they want to stay in the game. So uh, you'll, you'll probably see a lot of folks uh, bow out respectfully. And uh, when the dust settles, you're going to see uh, who's ready to keep their chips on the table and go all in. Do, do you think that's been the driving force behind these consolidations and these acquisitions that we've now seen over the past few months? Um, I think it, I, I don't know if it was be, if it would be the driving force. I think it's a factor. I think you know the timing is right. Imports are a little bit lower than they have been over the years. I mean, you're talking uh, we're under 300 million imports this year, which is very low. When you take the overall, if you look at of the cigar category as a whole, you're looking at about uh, eight to nine billion with a B units, and then you take premium cigars, and you're looking at 300 million with an M units or less. So, you know, right now I think the tide is low, and you have big companies that can widen their portfolio or widen their reach into the craft market or micro market or what we like to call it in our industry, the boutique market, and uh, they, can, they can grab companies at a steal, in my opinion. Um, you know, the other theory is they can also capitalize on the fear that um, the FDA is coming and uh, they may not have the wallet to support whatever it is the FDA is going to deem regulation. So, you know, I don't know. There, there's many different theories. I, I haven't really formulated a, uh, you know, spot-on theory about it, but I think you will see more acquisitions coming up, and uh, you will see the, the larger guys uh, uh, gobble up who who is a good company and, and who has promise for the future after the FDA says what they have to say. Exactly. I, I agree with you on that. Paul, did yeah. you have anything? I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good for right now. Okay. Sorry <laughs> to do that to you, Will. No, that's okay. <laughs> I want to give you a chance. Um, so, Victor, um, anything anything into next year that maybe we can look forward to? Are there some things maybe you're, you're tweaking, uh, playing around with right now? You know, I'm... Uh, Tobacco and premium cigars is a low, so I'm always, always doing something. Now, whether or not it actually happens, uh, meaning that a blend actually finalizes, you know, that's, that's another story. I mean, you take 40, 50, 60, uh, depending on the time of the year, maybe 100 blends that are being worked on, and, you know, as you know, one or two may make the cut by the trade show or by the next launch. But when I can tell you is an absolute definite is that the Tortuga Connecticut will be available in three sizes in January. The Cedro number no. 10, which is an extension of the Cedro number no. 5 and Bellicoso, will be available in January. And the El Coyote Negro 700 will be available in January. So there's quite a bit you have, you're going to be kicking off the year quite a bit with, um, and the 700, that's a 7 by 60, correct? Correct. Yeah. So there's quite a bit you have right now going, uh, you're going to be kicking off the year with a, with a big bang right now. That's right. Excellent, excellent. Well, Victor, thank you so much uh, for the time. Uh, all the support you've given, you've given me uh, over the past few years has been great. Um, and we good luck to you, and I know we'll, we'll be keeping in touch over the next few months. Thanks again for having me on. Yeah, it's uh, it's always a pleasure, really. Keep Thanks so much, doing. Victor. Are great. Thank you, Thank Victor. Thank you so much, Victor. We appreciate it. I'll see you soon. Have a good one. All right. Take bye bye. Care. Bye bye. Thanks. So, so with that, we're gonna take a short break. We're gonna take a short break, and then uh, we'll do Logan, some more segments. Logan from Cigar Federation's next. Excellent. All right. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. 
Chris, Chris says my cigar smells bad. 